what is your biggest weakness? When asked this question, many people respond with, I am a perfectionist. Perfectionism is the desire and refusal to accept anything less than perfect. In a study of nearly 25,000 working individuals, interviewers found that a desire to be perfect affects a person's effectiveness. Instead of doing the work that needs to be done, they worry about making it flawless. From a Christian perspective, it is a lack of trust. Because of this lack, we try to control the situations around us to ensure an ideal outcome. Instead, we should trust in the Lord and His perfection. Before we discuss the reasoning, we must first define some terms. We'll do that by looking at the secular view of perfectionism compared to what the Bible says. What does this word perfect really mean? What is this idea in our lives? From a secular perspective, it is not accepting anything less than perfect. Or, in other words, you are not allowed to make any mistakes whatsoever. Knowing that we are fallen sinful beings, it becomes clear that this standard is not possible. There is no way for us to achieve this. Trying to accomplish such goals only adds unwanted stress into our lives. In addition to stress, it can cause anxiety, depression, and many other mental health issues. All because of a fear of failure and shame of not being enough. Many athletes would justify perfectionism by saying that it is just a good work ethic. We begin to put our worth in things that will fail instead of putting our worth in the only thing that is reliable, and that is God. Some people say that God calls us to be perfect. In James 1, 2 through 4, it says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you encounter various trials, for that you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, and let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. In Greek 2, we learn to dig deeper into the words of the verses we were reading. The Greek for perfect in this verse translates to wholeness. I interviewed Herman Eben, who co-founded Great Solutions Group for my oral. In our discussion, we explored this idea of wholeness. He says, wholeness comes from subtraction and not addition. Addition would be trying to fill your life with anything that you can so that you can fill the hole in your life. But wholeness is having nothing but God. Therefore, to reach true wholeness, we must subtract everything from our lives except for God. Now that we have looked at wholeness, we must look at a component of secular perfectionism that being emotion. In our society, expressing any type of emotion besides happiness is seen as a weakness. Showing too much emotion is seen as a negative thing. We think that if we are tired, crying, or having simple human emotions, that we are more flawed. In Isaiah 53, there is a prophecy of Jesus Christ. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we would desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Jesus was sinless. He was perfect. But why does this prophecy not sound like our idea of perfection? Why are our standards so different now? Our thinking has changed. We have started to conform to the world and its thinking rather than to Jesus and his, instead of relying on Christ. Perfectionism can look appealing. Externally, it is seen as a good work ethic and a drive for excellence. What is wrong with wanting to be the best? Perfectionists are motivated and committed to their goals. Let's look at how this is appealing in the context of sports. Many coaches like these types of athletes because they're coachable. Coaches all tend to tell their teams this one phrase, practice makes perfect. This is communicating to the athlete that if you want to be perfect, then all you need to do is practice. Work hard to be the best, and eventually you will reach a point of flawlessness. But practice does not ensure perfection. Everyone has to practice something. No athlete would compete in their sport without practicing first. That would be unreasonable. Why would you willingly set yourself up for failure by not being prepared? By putting in countless hours, learning plays, and working as a team would logically result in a perfect performance. Other people look up to perfectionists. They see the external view of ambition, high grades, and big goals. Perfectionists are usually organized and pay attention to all the little details, which usually explains why they are so successful and why it looks so appealing from the outside. While externally it looks like a great thing, there are many dangers. Working countless hours to be the best at what you love does not seem like a bad thing, but internally it is a battle to prove to yourself that you are enough. Many people combat these things by just saying repeatedly, you are enough, when this is not helping the issue at all. You have to talk about the things that get in the way, those being shame, fear, and guilt about who we are and the things that we have done. But talking about these things is uncomfortable, and as a society, we shy away from uncomfortable things. We would rather take the easy way out and ignore the problem than put in the work to fix it. But in order to grow to be more Christ-like, we must do hard things. We think that we can rely on ourselves, but no matter how hard we try, we will fail without God. The world teaches us that our performance determines our worth, but in the eyes of the Lord, Jesus' performance is the one that matters and determines who we are. But we think that our performance, or our perfection, makes us deserving of love. 
Having flaws and being sinful would mean that we are not worthy of salvation. This type of thinking would be considered bad thinking. Wrong or bad thinking leads to wrong action. Reading the Bible shows us what good thinking would be. Relying on Jesus and his perfection for security in our lives. We expect control to take away an aspect of fear and give us a sense of security. But security only comes from being attached to something that is actually secure. We think that if we can control the situations around us, then we can make them perfect. But how can something so sinful make things perfect? The answer is, we cannot. In Great Books 4, we read the Screw Tape Letters by C.S. Lewis, where there is an uncle demon, Screw Tape, coaching the nephew, Wormwood, on how to tempt a human. Screw Tape says, The more he fears, the more he will hate, and hatred is also a great anodyne for shame. Without control, there is a constant fear that our mistakes will scare people away. This comes with a sense of shame about our actions. Brene Brown, in her book, The Gifts of Imperfection, talks about this shame. She says, shame is about fear, blame, and disconnection. We need to recognize when we feel shame and be able to react without running away. Many people's response to shame is to hide. Instead, we should recognize when we feel these things and change our thinking. Thinking drives our feelings. When we are feeling things with, when we are filling our lives with bad thinking, then we will feel things like shame about who we are. Therefore, we should fix our minds on what the Bible says. We should take a minute and, how, and think of how we are making the situation about ourselves and change it to how we can glorify our Creator. Brene Brown gives us three things that we can use to combat perfectionism. These gifts are courage, compassion, and connection. She says, to overcome perfectionism, we need to be able to acknowledge our vulnerabilities to the universal experiences of shame, judgment, and blame. Vulnerability would be considered the umbrella over these gifts. Vulnerability can be defined as openness. This could lead to being rejected for the things confessed, which explains why so many people do not like being vulnerable. It is intimidating to think that there is a possibility that we will not be liked, because naturally everybody wants to be liked. We think that once we open up, people will think that we are too much and leave, or criticize us for actions that we have done. These three gifts all have to do with being open with the people around you. Courage is all about being honest about the good and bad about ourselves. Many times we think courage must be something heroic. But ordinary courage is about putting your vulnerability on the line. We have to have the courage to talk to other people about the things that we struggle with. The Latin origin of compassion means to suffer with. As perfectionists, we fear failure in letting people down and the pain that comes with it. So when, we, when things happen, we protect ourselves by putting up walls and pushing people away. But true compassion is meeting people where they are in their suffering. Our first response to pain is to self-protect. The heart of compassion is really acceptance. We need to accept who we are and that we are not perfect. This requires being vulnerable to not only others, but ourselves too. Brene Brown defines connection as the energy that exists between people when they feel seen, heard, and valued, when they can give and receive without judgment, and when they derive sustenance and strength from the relationship. Humans desire to feel seen and heard. Connection comes from these feelings. When we are vulnerable, we need to know that the other person is listening, and this cultivates connection. All three of these gifts require vulnerability, but to be good at anything requires practice, which is where accountability comes in. Many people think that accountability is an attack on the person and not truth coming from a loving place about the action. We need people in our lives that we can talk to and that can keep us accountable in the practice of courage, compassion, and connection. It is not possible to be good at these things overnight. We have to work daily to change our thinking. Our imperfections glorify our Creator. They show us that we need God and force us to rely on Him more, proving that we cannot do this on our own. It is hard to let go of control and to rely on someone else, but it is necessary. Genesis 3 displays the story of the fall of man. Satan tempts Eve to eat the fruit by making her doubt the validity of what God had told them. He twisted the truth to say that the reason they could not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil is because it would make them like God. This desire would mean Eve would not have to rely on God anymore because they would be the same. Eating the fruit made them depend on themselves. Woman's chief sin is control. We can see this play out in the story of the fall. Eve wanted control and to be able to rely on herself. Not only did they trust God and his plan, but in the consequences of the sin, it became clear that we need God. Our society is very prideful. We like to think that we can do everything on our own. When we fail, we do not think that we can ask for help. This leads to trying to constantly prove to your yourself and your worth to others. We feel a need to show that we can do everything on our own. In Dallas Willard's book, Life Without Lack, he goes through Psalms 23. 
He says, the key to living a life without lack involves recognizing the idea systems that govern the present age and its respective cultures, as well as those that constitute life away from God and replacing them with the idea system that was embodied and taught by Jesus Christ. This means changing our thinking to realize that we cannot do anything without God. An example of an idea system of the present age would be the idea to live your truth. This is the thought that truth can be whatever you want it to be. But the truth is not whatever you feel like or whatever you want it to be in the moment. Let's say that our truth is that we are perfect. While trying to live up to that standard, it becomes clear through our failures that that cannot be true. Our imperfections are revealed through the truth and force us to depend on the one thing that is perfect. The goal of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Therefore, by being imperfect and relying on Him, it displays His glory. In conclusion, perfectionism is an internal battle to prove to everyone, including yourself, that you are enough. Being vulnerable is the key to combating feelings of shame, fear, and guilt, then replacing those ideas with courage, compassion, and connection. As a society, we almost encourage this idea by celebrating the successes that we are filling our lives with. We need to change our thinking from what the world teaches to what the Bible teaches and let go of control to start to rely on God for security. God is the only thing that we need in our lives. Therefore, we should trust Him and His perfection for direction of our lives. Thank you. Great job. <laughs> um, so to start us off, will you tell us about your plans for post-MCA? I will be attending Blinn College for a year and then transferring to Texas A&M University to study business administration and then go into accounting. Okay. Um, why are you interested in accounting? I really I like love numbers. Popular, not a popular <laughs> choice, but no. that's good. We need people who love numbers. <laughs> um, so... Um, first real question. Are you a perfectionist? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so um, whenever we first met at the beginning of this year, you knew already that you wanted to talk about perfectionism. So um, why, why, did you, why were you so sure you wanted to talk about this? Um, I think that I actually talked about this with my parents like at the end of last year after Josh did his oral. And we just kind of talked about how like, perfectionism is, is something that I've struggled with my entire life. Um, and just thinking that like I am not enough for anybody and so and I know it's not something that um, I only struggle with I know a lot of other people struggle with it too and so I just thought it would be good to kind of like research that more and then like learn more about something that I struggle with and be able to help others be able to get through that as well mm -hmm. yeah how's it been good to research that it was very convicting <laughs> but it was good <laughs> yeah yeah, I, I've also struggled with perfectionism, so our conversations throughout the year have been convicting for me, too, which is probably why God knew we were going to be together. <laughs> um, so, did when, like, in your life do you think you realized you were a perfectionist? Um, I don't think I realized it until probably, like, 7th and 8th grade, because I always... So I was a perfectionist in my grades, really every aspect of my life, but the success I was filling my life with was my grades. And so I would like freak out if I got like a bad grade and like a bad grade for me like would be like, like an 85 or something. Like it really wasn't that low. Um, and so I think just realizing that like in eighth grade, I didn't like fail a class, but grade books was really hard for me. And so just realizing that like, I really wanted to have those perfect grades and I wasn't getting them. And that was something that was really hard for me to understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so I kind of wanted to ask um, about how your perfectionism might have affected you in different areas of your life. Um, so you just touched on like academics. How do you think it's affected your relationships like with other people? So it goes into people pleasing. And so I don't feel like I'm enough, so then I try to get the approval of other people. And I'm filling my life with success, so I want them to recognize the success that I'm filling my life with, and then that in turn makes me feel like I'm enough. Mm -hmm. And so when I'm not getting that approval, then that means that I'm not enough. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's, you know, friendships aren't flourishing when we're just seeking approval yeah. um, from them. Yeah. What about, um, you've done sports at MCA, um, basketball all the way through and you played volleyball for a couple years right <laughs> how how has perfectionism like affected you we'll talk specifically about specifically about basketball because most people 
you know, miss more shots than they make. So, <laughs> um, so it was really hard when I would make mistakes because then I would think that like I was a failure. And so, um, when that's not true, um, but I would make like little tiny mistakes and be like, well, like I'm just awful apparently. Um, and then it actually was a lot this year because I got injured a lot. And so I was like constantly hurt and like, I just didn't understand like going, I was going to basketball and like going to practice and games and not being able to play. And then, so that was like really hard for me. Cause then I wasn't still not like getting that approved from other people. Cause like after the games, like I didn't play. So like I did a lot of cheering on the sidelines. You did great. Um, <laughs> and so that was really hard for me just to have to go from playing and being able to um, do like really well and like make shots and practice and then games that just like would not happen. And then, so then like after the games, I would be like really down and like think that I just wasn't enough for anything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What about in your spiritual walk? Do you think perfectionism has affected that? Yes. <laughs> so um, it really hit me this past summer, but um, I just like didn't think I was enough. Like I didn't think I was enough for anyone, and that included God. And so I didn't understand God's grace and His love for me, um, and that He would send. Jesus to die on the cross for me because I didn't think that I was worthy of that. Mm -hmm. Um, And so because I wasn't perfect. So when I would make mistakes and I was like, oh, then like I'm definitely not worthy of salvation now because I'm not perfect. Yeah. So do you have any, like over the past year or so, have you been able to implement anything to change those, like you said, negative or wrong thinking into, you know, thinking about truth? So for a long time, I actually wrote the reference Philippians 4, 8 on my wrist. And so when I would feel like I wasn't enough or I was filling my life with lies and believing them, then I would look down and um, just read that it said Philippians 4, 8 and then say the verse to myself and then realize that like the things that I was filling my life with were not truth. Mm-hmm. And so then I would replace it with things like um, that God knit me in my mother's womb and that he, um, that I am fearfully and wonderfully made because those things directly combat the feelings of not being enough. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. It's so hard to change our thinking. Um, it takes a lot of effort. So that's a good tangible physical reminder of that. That's awesome. Um, why do you think, so you described that perfectionists feel the need to prove to themselves that they are worthy or perfect or enough. Do you think, like, why do you think perfectionists feel that way? Are they just, like, wired differently? Or is there, like, internal or external factors who is, that have influenced them into thinking that way throughout their life? What do you think? Um, I think it's internal. Because I think that you're insecure, and then it takes humility to be able to understand and realize that we are not perfect. And so we think that we have to, I think it also comes externally because I think like in society, it's almost encouraged to be like, have it all together. Um, And so going from like thinking that you have to have it all together and then you think that, oh, well, I don't have it all together and that person over there does. So that means I must be worse off than them. And so Mm -hmm. I'm not enough for that. And so then it takes humility to understand that and then have to realize that no one is perfect Mm -hmm. yeah yeah perfectionism is like it's such a hoax because (laughs) we like you know believe that we need to be perfect but we can't be perfect so it's like yeah it's kind of a trap (laughs) all right thanks hp uh, hannah um (laughs) i I will pass it off for now (laughs) thank you kp In your thesis, you mentioned the fear of failure. Um, I heard, in fact, it was Mr. Snell shared with me an interview that uh, Giannis had last week. Did you happen to see that? I it was did not. his Milwaukee Bucks had just been knocked out of the playoffs, and they were the number one seed, and then uh, the number, number eight seed had beaten them. And so the reporter said, "So, does this mean your season was a failure?" 
and he responded by asking the reporter several questions like, you know, are you a failure if, if you uh, didn't get a promotion this year? Or was, um, was uh, Michael Jordan a failure all those years that he didn't win a championship? And he ended up coming, Giannis said, in sports there is no failure. How, how would you respond to his statement? I would agree. Um, I don't think there is failure. Um, I think there is difficulties that you have to go through in a journey of seeking success and like, well, not necessarily seeking success, but um, in a search for excellence. So I think that you have to go through these difficulties and these trials and these setbacks to reach this point of excellence because it's not going to just be easy. Like, it's not just going to be handed to you. Do you recall in the Knights athletic acronym, K-N-I-G-H-T-S, you know, know your role, now's the time. Do you remember what the S was for? Striving is winning. And so how does that apply? Um, I think just, I think striving for excellence. And so, like, it may not come out in your stats or your record that year, but I think striving for excellence and being the best that you can be is winning. So is um, every season that doesn't end in a state championship a failure? No. Is every loss a failure? No. Uh, is every test taken that isn't done perfectly a failure? No. These are easy questions, huh? <laughs> <laughs> what if you have to do a retake on the test that your, your percentage is there? Is that a, oh, I failed. Is that a failure? For a long time, I thought so, but no. <laughs> what, what is it? I think it's just an opportunity to learn the things that you didn't know before. For me, like, the first test I had to retake was in physics. And so the first test that I failed, I was very upset. Um, especially since people that I had been helping in the section passed. Um, <laughs> shout out Park. Um, <laughs> and... <laughs> I had been helping him like the whole section and then he passed it and I failed. Um, and so I had to retake it. You're a good teacher. <laughs> um, and so in that moment, I thought it was a failure. And so, and I was really upset about that. But I talked to my older brother, Josh, um, and he is not mathematically inclined. Um, and so he was like, <laughs> he was like, the thing is, is like, it's not a failure, it's just you didn't understand it before, and so now you can go back and learn to understand it now. So, yeah. How would you suggest to an athlete that's going into a game that they are just almost for sure they're going to lose? How would you ask them to approach that game? What would be a healthy way? Um, I think you should still try and like give your best effort, but also like keep in perspective that to like to have fun with it as well because we went into many games this last season um, that we would before the game we would all be talking and be like well like we're not going to win but like we might as well go and try and like work on the things that we can and so like if we weren't going to win we would try to run offense for like a certain amount of time usually did not get there but <laughs> we tried really hard um, and so I think Doing that in sports is an opportunity to learn and grow in the things that you need to learn and grow in. And so the opposite, what if you know you're going to win? How, how should your approach be as a team? I think the same thing. Um, I think you should still try and also like work on new plays, like try something new, um, and not just mess around and be like, oh, well, we're going to win anyway, so might as well just not try. And what about all the in-betweens when you... Going in, you say, oh, we're pretty equally matched here. How should the approach be? Should it change? No, I think it should be the same. I think any time you go into a sports game, you should be thinking about how you can better yourself and go into it with the perspective of we might win, we might not, but we're going to try our hardest. Yeah. It just really is our approach to so many times we look at the scoreboard, but uh, there's just so much to be learned from just doing it. I, I just love competition. 
uh, just it really motivates me. Last night I got to go uh, to open pickleball, and uh, it's the first time I'd shown up to it, and uh, won some, lost some, walked off once after singles, and my wife says, you got waxed. <laughs> And I said, yeah, I only won one point. And my opponent said, uh, no, you won one rally, but you didn't win a point. Uh, you know, because you only score when you're serving. So, uh, And yet, I was really motivated by it. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, do you find the same thing for yourself? Um, no, I'm very competitive. <laughs> and so when I'm not winning, I usually get very mad. Uh, Hannah and I played tennis this year, and <laughs> we were not very good. And so <laughs> during the game, the whole time, we'd be like, well, like, we're trying. And then, like, we would have the perspective. Cassie would take us to go get tea after every game. And so <laughs> the whole time, we would be, like, in the middle of the game and be like, oh, like, we get to go get tea after this, so like that's exciting. <laughs> and then after the game, we would usually both be like very upset, um, and it would like take a little bit. But we both had to realize that like, yes, we are competitive, but like, it doesn't matter that much. It shouldn't be that important that it affects like the rest of our lives. Yeah, this was brought out really well last night in Thaden's uh, thesis about competition. I, I really enjoyed it. That. It um, is more of a cooperation that you're you're loving your opponent by serving them by doing your very best because that makes them better and they're doing the same thing as they love you by uh, making you better and it's it's what I really enjoy about competition. I'll ask some more questions later. Good job, HP. Um, it's okay. We still love you, Josh. <laughs> <laughs> so. I want to. Uh, I'm very curious, kind of, about your your journey um, as you as you've talked about, you know, from being a perfectionist to somebody who maybe understands that in the right perspective. And I kind of want to start that off with an interesting question: okay. um, Were you a good perfectionist? No. You, okay. <laughs> yeah. So there's also uh, just that idea of a good perfectionist is not a perfect perfect perfectionist, right? Yeah. Yeah. So what time did, like, what year would you say that you maybe began to understand that at MCA? Would you say that you grew in that maybe, like, in a sophomore when you were failing that physics test, or was it, was it in junior year? Like, was there a certain point in time when you said, I can't keep living like this, something has to change, or was it a gradual process? I think it was a gradual process. Um, I think that I realized that perfectionism was a struggle in my life in around eighth grade, and then it kind of like went away. I did like I didn't really think about it again. And then sophomore year came around, and I did fail a few physics tests. And in that, then I realized like, yes, I am still struggling with perfectionism. And then I again didn't think about it until like this summer, um, and that's when I really like realized that like this is something that I need to change. Yeah, very good. Um, something that you mentioned that struck me is this idea of excellence. Um, can you define excellence for us? And then we're going to kind of talk about how it's different from perfectionism. I think excellence is like the... I think striving for excellence is striving to do the best that you can. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Can I can I be excellent without being perfect? Yes. Okay. So then, what's the so what's the difference then is between excellence and perfectionism? Because we talked about perfectionism being something that we strive towards but can never really achieve. But if I can achieve being excellent, then how are those two things different from each other? Being perfect would mean that you are not allowed to make any mistakes whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And I think excellence. I think mistakes are a part of it. I think to be excellent, like mistakes are going to be a part of the journey to reach there. Okay. Um, so what about like the let's go to the the great book student that uh, you know puts in a lot of effort towards let's say a paper and and um, you know doesn't achieve in a hundred but they achieve in ninety um, and let's say another student has really high aptitude in great books and is lazy and slacks off and also makes a ninety. Well, they both made the same score, but like, how is excellence 
used uh, or, or seen in those two examples and how is, is it not? Does that make sense? I think excellence would be seen in the actual work and not the outcome. Okay. Yeah, that's very good. Um, speaking of that, uh, I really liked what you said about this idea of practice makes perfect, and you kind of talked a little bit about how that's not entirely true. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that that's a dangerous statement that we go around saying? It just kind of has you know, gotten into our vocabulary that practice makes perfect. Do you think there's a danger to that? I think there is because it's telling people that perfection is an achievable standard. When you're telling people that, well, practice makes perfect, then you think that, well, all I have to do is practice and then I will be perfect when we're never going to reach perfection. Mm -hmm. Right, and if I practice poorly, then right, I won't yeah. achieve it. Would there be a different phrase that you would use to replace that instead of practice makes perfect, practice makes some, I don't know, would you change that? How would you change that for us? I don't know how I would change it. Something that Coach Whitehead always told us was like, um, we would be in practice and like running plays, and if we like were kind of messing around, he'd be like, well, like when we get to the game, like something's going to happen, and you're not going to know what to do because we're like not taking it seriously and not actually learning the plays. Um, and so he kind of told us that like we can't like simulate what's going to happen in the game in practice. So you just have to be ready to do whatever. So hmm. I don't really know like how I would change. No, that, that makes sense because I think practice makes permanent would be, would be my way to say that. But you just described that, right? You described that if I'm messing around in practice, that's how I'm practicing. Mm -hmm. Then when I get into the game, Coach White has saying that, well, that's what you just made permanent is mm -hmm. the way that you did practice. Um, Okay, yeah, thank you very much. I want to pass it back to KP. <laughs> I'm so sorry I forgot about your prestigious MCA tennis career earlier when I mentioned <laughs> basketball and volleyball. <laughs> but also I think it's a, a match, not a game in tennis. Yeah, it is. <laughs> so, it's okay. <laughs> we forgive you. <laughs> I didn't know anything about tennis before this year, and I still don't. So. <laughs> It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> um, so I kind of want to go back to this idea of excellence versus perfectionism, or perfection that y'all are talking about. Um, and you said that the difference is um, being focused on a result versus, like, the outcome versus the process and the work. Um, so have you found a way that you can enjoy, like, the process and experience rather than only focusing and looking towards the outcome? what you're working for? Um, this is something that I'm not very good at. But I think uh, in, specifically in school, um, focusing more on the fact that you had to try to, and the work that you put in instead of the grades. Because I think starting with the perspective of that you're going to try to do the best that you can, the grades like will come with that, especially at MCA when we have provisions. Um, and so I think just being more focused on um, the work that you're doing in the beginning instead of waiting until the outcome is there and then having to look back. So I think having the right perspective from the beginning Mm -hmm. would change that. Yeah, that's good. Um, is there ever a temptation for you, or do you think any perfectionist, to realize, oh, I'm not going to be able to do this perfectly, so let me just give up on it? It's not worth it if I can't do it perfectly? Yes. <laughs> um, actually, in writing my oral, this um, it was really hard for me to just start it, because I knew the first time that I wrote it, it was not going to be perfect. And so the hardest thing for me was just to actually start. And once I got started, like, it was fine. But I was struggling so much with wanting everything to be so perfect that I wouldn't even start it. Mm -hmm. so. what, what do you think, like, I think you mentioned in your 
like that perfectionism is kind of protecting us like a shield what's it protecting us from so um as a perfectionist you fear failure and letting people down and so we think that um by putting up walls and like pushing people away that that is protecting us Mm -hmm. um but it's not really protecting anything um but I think it's just you're scared of the pain that's going to come with making a mistake. Mm-hmm. And so you try to push everybody away and put up walls and make it seem like you have it all together because from the outside it looks like you're doing great. Mm-hmm. And so everyone else thinks that, oh, like they have it all together, but in, like inside you don't. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What actually happens when we like tear those walls down and like put down the shield of perfectionism is is it what we expect no to happen what you expect is that people are going to think that you're too much or that your mistakes are going to scare them away Mm -hmm. but in reality i think that it actually grows your relationships more Mm -hmm. yeah how does it grow our relationships more um i think in going through struggles together and working through that it makes you like it bonds you together Mm -hmm. and that you can grow more because like not everybody in your life is going to know every little detail and so I think those like few group that know about all the things that you struggle with that they um those relationships are stronger in the end Mm -hmm. yeah and I think it goes back to Brene Brown's um gifts of imperfection like if we have those walls up then how are we supposed to build meaningful connections and um allow others to feel compassionate for us and then us to feel compassionate for them as well yeah um okay so a verse that i thought about um throughout reading your thesis is from matthew i think five but it also kind of looks like a six on my paper (laughs) so matthew something verse 48 and it says (laughs) you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect um and so that greek word for perfect it might be the same one from the verse you mentioned I don't really know that much about Greek, but it means um, brought to its end, completed. Um, So how does that, how does perfectionism in that sense differ from the world's ideal of perfectionism? So the world's ideal of perfectionism is that you can't make any mistakes. Um, And then it is the same verse or the same word. Um, And so it means wholeness or complete. And so the way we reach this idea of wholeness or completeness is by having Christ. And so um, I think just like living your life to glorify God and instead of doing things for the approval of other people would be the difference between the worldly perfectionism and then the perfect that's in that verse Mm -hmm. yeah that's good and um i really like the quote that you shared from your interview that wholeness comes from subtraction not addition um so like what does that look like practically you said we must subtract everything from our life except god does that mean i don't mean literally okay but (laughs) um i think just having the perspective of um glorifying god in the things that you're doing So addition would be trying to fill your life with anything that you can to fill the hole. So you're filling your life with worldly successes and getting that approval from other people. That would be considered addition. And Mm -hmm. so subtraction would be subtracting that perspective of I'm doing this for the approval of other people. And instead, I'm doing it to please God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's good that we don't have to actually like cut out things from our life literally yeah but cut out negative thinking and bad perspectives that are making those things um you know not not as good as they should be um um, something else i thought of is the story of mary and martha are you familiar with that story um kind of (laughs) vaguely what do you remember about it um i know that they were with jesus and I don't remember which one it was, but one of them was, like, doing a bunch of chores, and the other one was just sitting and being with Christ. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Um, It was Mary who was sitting at the Lord's feet and listening to his teaching, and Martha said she was distracted with much serving. Um, And I don't know if Martha was a perfectionist. It doesn't say for sure, but 
Um, that's kind of some of the tendencies I feel like I've seen in myself in seasons of perfectionism. Um, but do you remember what Jesus says to Martha? No. It's okay. <laughs> so he says, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Um, so I'm just curious, what are your thoughts um, about what, when we choose perfectionism, what are we giving up in order to, you know, just try to work harder and do more, improve um, ourselves? What do we give up in Control. doing that? Uh, so a part of perfectionism is you try to control everything around you to make them perfect. Mm -hmm. uh, and so because it's really hard to realize that if I don't have control, then there is a possibility that it's not going to be perfect. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that in giving up perfectionism, you have to give away, give up that aspect of control. Yeah, absolutely. And what do we, when, when we are perfectionists, what good things are we missing out on? Um, I think you're missing out on, first of all, stronger relationships. Um, and like, you grow more when you have to go through um, trials and like it, through those difficulties. Um, so yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's good. Um, okay, I'll pass it on. <laughs> Hannah, you stated that our performance or perfection isn't what makes us deserving of love. If that's not what makes us deserving of love, what does? So, there's a quote that I had. Um, it says that the world teaches us that our performance determines our worth, but in the eyes of the Lord, Jesus' performance is the one that matters and determines who we are. So, I think... Our thinking that our performance or our perfection makes us deserving of love, I think that is a very prideful thought in that we think that what we do is going to make us deserving of God's love um, because we are sinful. And so I think that... So that's that thought. And then... Um, I think that God, he created us in his own image. And so he's loved us from then, um, even though we are sinful and we still make those mistakes. I think that he still loves us through that, if that makes sense. Did that answer the question? I don't think it did. I think you're fine. Uh, a number of years ago before I lived in Midland, we were visiting family here, and visiting church, and they had a... Uh, a guest speaker, he was a seminary professor, and he was telling a story about grace. They'd had a college class on grace, and it was time for their final, and they all walked in, the tests were upside down on their tests, on their desks, and he said, okay, now begin. And they turned their tests over, and every one of them had the answers written in, and an A-plus on the top of the page. And he says, there's nothing you can do to uh, get a higher grade, uh, nothing to lower it, you get an A-plus, but now turn the paper over and, and tell me what you've learned about grace about this. And so it's just the idea that it was a response, that instead of trying to be uh, earning God's love, getting God's love, uh, because we think we deserved it, we, we did perfect enough, but instead everything we're doing, uh, I really liked what Thaden said, it was more of a diligence thing, that we're just being diligent about everything we do, and I saw that in class. You're always very diligent. You do that in everything in your life. But it's not to uh, be better than anybody else or to uh, get the A+, plus, but it's just out of thankfulness. God has done so much for me. I just want to respond. Uh, do you have any reaction to that, that concept? Um, I think it's the right idea that we don't really deserve the salvation that we're given. Um, and that God's grace and mercy is so, um, I don't know the word, but he, 
is he has so much grace that we can come to him again and again and be imperfect and he still loves us so mm -hmm. yeah Right towards the end of your thesis, you had these two sentences. The goal of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. Therefore, by being imperfect and relying on Him, it displays His glory. And it made me think about a verse in Isaiah 43, 25 that I've been thinking about lately. And God is saying, I, even I, am He who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sin no, no more. And so I was really struck by that because it seems like having my sins forgiven is a really good thing for me, having our sins forgiven. Yet God says, I'm going to blot out all your sins, forgive them, and not remember them anymore for his own sake. Why do you think that is? I think if he didn't forgive our sins, that not many people would follow him. I think there is um, a lot to say about how he is very forgiving and that in that we can come to him with our flaws and he still is accepting of that. And that our fallenness actually brings him glory? Yes. Um, I think that because we are fallen, it just shows how much more glory he has because he is perfect. And so, I mean, we think that we're pretty great down here and we're not perfect. And so just to think of something that actually is perfect is something that's um, really mind-blowing. Good. So I'm somebody that has uh, struggled a lot with perfectionism in life. It's something I've thought a lot about. Um, do you think perfectionism is something that you can, we can overcome and then we've, we've conquered it, we're done with it? Or do you think it's something that we will battle for the rest of our lives? I think it's something that we'll battle for the rest of our lives. Okay. Um, I think that you have to work. I said this in my paper, but I think it's something that you have to work daily to th change your thinking about. Um, and that there's still going to be moments that this perfectionism is something that you struggle with again and that you still have to change your thinking and think about it again. Yeah. Um, so I was thinking, I was reading through your paper and reading about vulnerability. Um, and I was thinking of the, the meme where it says, one does not simply, you know, <laughs> one does not simply just decide to flip a switch and just be vulnerable with people. Right. So can you you know, express any strategies or ideas for how somebody who's struggling with perfectionism can decide to then be vulnerable about their weaknesses? So you have to find people that you can trust. Um, and so it took me a long time actually to do this, but in finding people that I could trust, it was very hard for me to open up about things that I struggle with, um, but because I had those close relationships then, and we were struggling with things at the same time, and they were telling me things that they were struggling with, then it made it feel like, oh, like if they trust me enough to tell me about something that they're struggling with, then I can do the same for them. Um, and so I think it's more of finding the right people and the right relationships, and then from there is where you can start to open up about yeah, I definitely agree with you. Um, so thinking, you know, towards next fall, going off to Blinn, um, I haven't heard too many other people from your grade say they're going off to Blinn, no. right? Uh, so first of all, I applaud you because that's a, you know, a brave decision. Um, but have you thought about, you know, how you're going to try to cultivate that community uh, while you're there at college to, you know, continue helping you walk down this road of, uh, you know, excellence rather than perfectionism? So, Blinn is in Bryan, Texas, so I'm going to be right there with a lot of other people. Um, BCS, as we affectionately yes. call it. Yeah. Um, but I think also finding people in like classes that I'm taking and just like finding that common interest and then being able to 
um, grow those relationships while still having my same relationships that I have now. Yeah, very good. I think that's going to wrap it up for us. So time for your question for us. Okay, so there's one for each of you. Um, so we'll start with Mr. Snow. Hey. Um, if you could pick any sport to be good at without the risk of getting hurt, what would it be and why? <laughs> any sport to be good at? Um, I want to pick like a really obscure sport now because, oh, yeah. but uh, without getting hurt. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, can we just say golf? Like, I know I don't, there's not like a lot of risk of being like really good at golf, but like if you could be really good at golf, you could be good at golf for the rest of your life. That's true. Right? Like, I wouldn't be just playing, you know, American football until I'm, you know, 45 like Tom Brady, but like you could play till you, you know, until you're 85. That would be like a lifelong thing. Um, so, but if you want to, if you want something like with the injury part like thrown in there, like I'm an invincible, you know, mm -hmm. character. Uh, let's say American football. Yeah, we'll go with that okay. one. <laughs> okay. So, Mr. Blackburn, during Kylie's oral, you said that you really loved music. So, if you had to pick one song to listen to for the rest of your life, what would it be and why? <laughs> <laughs> one song. I feel like answering like Mr. Z that's just the most recent song like he said it was his most recent book or in the next book because my mind's still going around last Sunday's worship service and uh, those songs just keep running through my head um, I'd have to go with How Great Thou Art that I mentioned in a previous oral oh I didn't say why <laughs> uh, I'm not being very diligent here um, I've grown up with that song. I've had so many good memories with it. It uh, has good theology and it focuses on God. So I would pick that one. Okay. So, Ms. Keenis, you worked at camp. And so, what is your favorite memory from working at camp? Okay. She did tell me this question before. Mm -hmm. And y'all are lucky because I started with nine options. <laughs> <laughs> but I've narrowed it down to two, so I hope oh, that's okay. Yeah. I mean, we always you find a way to, yeah. to not answer the question directly, even though we just <laughs> ask questions for 30 minutes straight. Um, okay, so I'm going to say like a more spiritual one and a more silly one, if okay. you will. So the first one is just in general baptisms at camp. Um, I My second summer, no, well, four summers of coach overall. Second summer at sports camp. Um, at the end of the summer, got baptized by my cub leader, um, so that was really special. Um, and I also grew up going to camp, so it was just cool to get baptized, um, you know, in the pool that I swim in when I was a little camper, um, and by my cub leader, who meant a lot, to, a lot to me. And then when I was a cub leader, getting to baptize some of my cub girls, um, a couple who were like childhood friends I had grown up with going to camp with. So that was just really special, and it's just always sweet to see baptisms um, at camp and just see how the Lord is working. Um, I think like it's cool seeing how the Lord worked in staff um, and coaches lives um, even though like you know the main focus is we're there for the campers the Lord is still working um, through the staff as well. Um, and then the, the silly one is um, my first summer coaching at sports camp um, they didn't have a work crew yet like high school kids that came in to do work crew and so they would like just have girl coaches rotate through for the week. So I was on kitchen crew first week of the summer um, and Monday lunch, yellow meal. Um, if y'all are familiar, it's chicken nuggets among some other things. And so of course there's ketchup um, to go with the chicken nuggets and we just have like reusable ketchup bottles. Um, so me and this other girl were assigned to go fill them up. Um, but we accidentally grabbed the marinara sauce instead because <laughs> it's just, you know, we were like, oh, there's a tomato on that. That's probably it. <laughs> and we served three lunches that day. The first one to the day camp coaches who were in training, second one to the sports camp girls. And then finally, the third lunch, sports camp boys, this coach comes over and he's like, oh, this like doesn't really taste right. Like, is this ketchup expired or something? And then we looked back and found the can of marinara sauce that we filled up all the bottles with. <laughs> so, yeah. 
That, I don't know. It just stands out. It's a <laughs> funny, funny time. All right. Great job, HP. Um, Pat, or Mr. Blackburn. <laughs> <laughs> Will you close us in prayer? Certainly, Mrs. Keenest. <laughs> Most holy God, we bless you. You are enough. We thank you for your goodness and your greatness. Thank you for the way you've worked through Hannah and the way you will continue to work. We thank you for this great week at MCA and pray that you give each one um, great memories, great lessons learned that will inspire many. And we've done it all for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.